Bible this morning, turn to Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> we will continue the theme of the resurrection. The title this morning to the message is Lasting Impressions. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, we read these words. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. In Luke chapter 24, and I'll read this to you, Luke chapter 24, verse 39, Jesus rose from the dead and he uh, showed himself to his disciples. He said, Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. One of the most uh, amazing things that I find in the Bible that is that Jesus Christ retains those marks, those scars. And somebody has uh, put it uh, this way, that the only imperfect body that will be in heaven will be Jesus Christ's body. And I'd like to bring you a message about that called Lasting Impressions. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, may you bless the message now. I pray that you speak to those here. And thank you, Father, for our resurrected Savior. Without Him, Lord, we, our religion is dead and vain and worthless. And we are still in our sins. And Father, we are so thankful that He rose from the dead. Lord, that He is alive in our hearts. That we know Him as well as we know someone here in our life. And thank you, Father, for that opportunity. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, if there be an unbelieving heart in here today, I pray that they'd see the truth. I, say, I pray that they'd see that it's a risen Savior that can save. If He came up, they can come up. And Father, I pray that you just uh, speak to hearts today and just thank you for the opportunity. Lord, may you bless the message now. For I ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> the fact that He built, still bears those marks... Can you imagine for all eternity? I thought about this. Uh, when uh, children will be born, and we know that their the population just keeps growing, and there's going to be children born in eternity. And you know that children are inquisitive. Now, I don't know if they're going to be born with some type of omniscience. I don't know if I believe that. I, we might have omniscience, but I'm not sure everybody's going to be born knowing everything. But can you imagine these children that seeing everybody with these perfect bodies, with these, at least the... The church, the, uh, the Lamb's Bride, we've got new bodies and they're eternal and they never get sick and they never feel pain and we never die. And I, I understand all that, but there's one body that they see and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's got holes in His hands and in His feet. And he's got a hole in His side and He's got, uh, he's got torn areas above His brow and His back looks like a plowed field. You know, his kids going to say, why is he, what happened to him? I mean, that, that would be the question that a child would, that would be the question anybody would ask if they saw somebody like that. And we're talking about the Creator. We're talking about the Creator as bearing the passion of the cross. So I want to talk about, I want to talk about lasting impressions. This world made an impression upon Jesus Christ that will last forever. Lasting impression talking about those marks, talking about those scars that he'll bear for eternity. And the first thing is it pronounced guilt on the whole world. The impressions the world left on Christ are undeniable. Undeniable. In Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, These which I, uh, which I was wounded in the house of my friends. When you see Jesus Christ... Whether you're saved or lost, you know one thing. I caused those wounds. I'm the guilty party. The Lord's not going to let us forget that. In Zechariah 12, 10, he said, I'll pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be embittered for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Because we know what we did. The world should know what they did. And you know what? Maybe the world won't be reminded right now, but they'll be reminded later. You see what they're going to be reminded of? Well, when the world sees them, they'll know exactly what they've done. God put His best foot forward and the world put a spike through it. 
God offered man the right hand of fellowship, instead got it nailed to a cross. God met men face to face, only to have them crown him with thorns. God opened his heart, and men put a spear through it. God came to this world and returned with brutal scars. He was interrogated with cruelty, beaten without counsel, whipped with brutality, humiliated before humanity, and condemned without a cause. I don't know how we could have treated him any worse. When he came into the world, they didn't have enough clothes to even put on him. They had to wrap him in grave clothes. And then he had to be born in a barn because there was no room in the inn. We're talking about the crater. You know, it says in there, twice he asked for water in his lifetime. He asked somebody for a cup of water, and neither time did he get it. <laughs> neither time. You say, what are those marks going to do? Those marks are going to show the world they're all guilty. Because this is what you did to your creator when he showed up. Now, I realize that's part of the plan, but you didn't have to do it. Hey, the Jews didn't have to call for his crucifixion. The Romans didn't have to go along with it. It had happened anyway. Sooner or later, it would have happened. But it just shows you what the world thinks of their creator. He says he came into his own, his own received him not. Listen, those marks, they show the guilt of the whole world. And not only those lasting impressions proved his resurrection. Why? Those impressions identified him. In John chapter 20, verse 24 to 29, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. You just read this chapter, didn't you? Then the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. And then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. They didn't have to ask who it was. They knew who it was. It said when they were on the shore and they saw Jesus, when they came to shore and they saw him uh, 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 laying out bread and fish for him to eat, they didn't ask who he was. They knew exactly who he was. If they recognized him, they also saw the print of the nails and, the, and in his feet and in his side and on his brow. It, it proved he rose from the dead because it was him and he had the marks of the cross. He bore the passion of it. It said to whom he showed himself alive after his passion. You know, the Lord could have... I mean, the Bible says that when we get a resurrected body, it's perfect. But why wouldn't he have one like that? Because those lasting impressions say a lot of things. And the first thing he said, pronounced guilt on the whole world. The second thing, those lasting impressions proved his resurrection... The third thing is it provided salvation for all. You see, those impressions forever remind the Lord that the payment was made. You think about that. I mean, not only are we going to look at it, but the Lord himself has to see. I mean, he sees those, listen, the marks of uh, the passion of the cross, those impressions tell him the payment's been made. The payment's been made. 1 John 2, 2 says, And He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's the satisfaction for it. Those marks prove it. You know, God did have a plan. The Calvinists run the wrong way with this verse, but in Revelation 13, 8, it says that He was slain from the foundation of the world. Well, we know that He was actually crucified in 33 A.D., but before the foundation of the world, before God ever built anything, before God ever laid a one building block of the foundation of the world, He had a plan and He had a purpose. I don't know if you know or not think about this, but before, before Lucifer ever had it in his heart to rebel against God, before, before Eve ever decided to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God had a plan. He already had a purpose. It was already cast in stone that this was going to take place. I like the fact that the Lord sees a problem, but He's already got the plan to fix the problem. I think that's true for us.
in our everyday life. I mean, God's had eternity to think about what's going to happen to you. <laughs> think about all your problems. He's taking care of the sin problem. There may be some pain in it. There may be some suffering in it. But he is taking care of it, isn't he? Hey, those impressions prove it. And he was slain from the foundation of the world. God knew what was going to happen. He said, I got a plan. Got a plan. He wasn't just making it up as he went along. I think the Lord knew that sin was always a possibility. If you have free will beings, you're going to have the possibility somebody's going to sin. I think it was inevitable. And God had to, he had to put an end to that kind of thing. Listen, it'll never happen again. Why? When you see those marks, you're not going to do it again. When you see that lake of fire, you're going to be convinced not to do it again. You won't want to, listen. You'll love God so much. I think God had to prove himself as a creator. I think he had to prove himself as, as the Bible says he became perfect, a perfect savior through the things which he suffered. He had to come down here and suffer. You see, God's already perfect. I, I know that, but to be a savior, he had to be a man. He had never been a man before. And he suffered these things. And he, he showed what kind of creator he was. I mean, he could have just wiped it all out and said, I'll start over. Threw everybody in hell and that was it. But he didn't. He had a plan. The Bible says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God tackled the problem head on and said, I want to save what I can. And that's exactly what he's doing. Listen, you can't force somebody to be saved. They have free will. But you can sure pray for them. You can sure put God on their trail. In Genesis 22, 8, said Abraham, I, I, you know, Abraham said this to Isaac, and the type is just, makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. Abraham's a type of God the Father, and Isaac's a type of God the Son. And it says God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Two ways you can read that, you know. That, at that particular moment, there was a ram caught in the thickets. God provided a lamb. But it says God will provide himself a lamb. And that's what God did. When John see Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And you know who it was? It was God manifest in the flesh. It provided salvation for all. Also, those impressions, those lasting impressions, prohibit excuses from the sinner and the saint. It forever reminds man that a payment was made. Not just remind God that a payment was made, it reminds us. Kind of hard to get self-righteous, you know, when you're standing before the Lord and there's, there's those uh, holes in his hands and in his feet, and that brow, that beard, I don't know, parts of that beard being plucked out, and you're looking at that body, you know, man. Whatever you accomplish for God, you can't ring your bell about it. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us that without, he said, without me, you can do nothing. Anything we accomplish for the Lord is because of the Lord, not because of us. But it prohibits excuses, those marks do, <laughs> from the sinner and the saint. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, it says, The times of this ignorance God winked at, talking about the Old Testament situations. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Those impressions will shut the mouth of the self-righteous. What are you going to say? You're, you're brought before the Lord in judgment and you're looking at Him and He's got those hands and are those holes in His hands and His feet? What are you going to say? I did it on my own? I'm good enough to be here? Those impressions will just knock you off your feet. John 15, 22 says... If I had not come and spoken to them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. There may have been a time in the Old Testament where a man lived by his own righteousness, the just shall live by his faith, the Bible says. 
And that, there may have been a certain amount of personal righteousness involved there, but it, that's not what saves them. It might get them the right to salvation, but it's not what saves them. In this age, you have to trust the blood of Christ in that only. Not only that, but it, it, those uh, lasting impressions pledge judgment to all those who reject God's mercy. Those impressions seal the fate of sinners. The great white throne judgment as a lamb slain before the family. Can you imagine here he is as a lamb slain and they stand before him and give account. All the while they're talking about their works. There he is. Holds in his hands and his feet. He'll seal their fate. You know what Hebrews 10.29 says? How much of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. How much sore punishment? You know, we've always said that it's not your sins that, it's not your sins that you've committed that sends you to hell. It's your rejection of Jesus Christ that sends you to hell. Because he made payment for all the sins. God can save a man in this age from any sin, no matter what it is. He can be a serial killer. He can be a pederast. He can be the worst stinking human being on this planet. And God can save him. And sometimes God has saved the, the worst of us. But woe unto them, boy, they think they're going to stand there and plead their case that somehow they, they earned it or they deserved it. Deserve salvation, and there he is bearing the marks of that cross. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. You can't get away with killing God's Son and then rejecting his forgiveness. It won't happen. You talk about, listen, when those lost, I saw a great white throne. When, you, when that happens, they see him, they know they're toast. They know their goose is cooked. They know their bacon is fried when they see those marks. Because those impressions condemn them. Because he had to come here and he had to suffer that to save us. And there are folks that just, they make light of that. They don't think they need that. And not only pledges judgment to all those who reject God's mercy, but those impressions proclaim that the Lamb is worthy. Those depressions declare he, His worth. He earned something. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 to 6, it says, I saw on the right hand of Him that sat on the throne a book written and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? It says, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. Somebody asked me about that not too long ago, that passage. And I wept much. They said, why was he weeping about that so much? And I, I don't know the answer. But evidently, man, they really needed to know what was in this book. They really needed to know. Some say it's the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel. It says, or, or the book of Revelation or the Bible itself because if you look on the back, there's seven seals back there. But somebody wasn't, they couldn't find anybody worthy. It says, and no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. You notice it likens him unto a lion there. He showed up as a lamb. He comes back as a lion. But it still says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain. Even though he's represented as a lion coming back, still bears the marks. It proclaims that the Lamb is worthy. Those impressions, listen, when He went to the cross, he took the, he took the curse of the creation by those crown of thorns. He took the curse of mankind by hanging there and paying for their sins. 
He's worthy. He was the only one that was worthy to open the seals. He prevailed because of his sacrifice at Calvary. And one of the last things those impressions uh, prove or, or promises his return. This thing's not done yet. Listen, when he rose from the dead, he showed them and, and uh, they believed on him and many more believed on him. Many have believed on him. But that's not the end of the story. Coming back. Uh, there's, those marks tell me there's unfinished business in this world. And the Lord's going to come back. And you know what? This world, those impressions are going to haunt this world when He returns. They're going to see Him. It says in Matthew 24, 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. It's not going to be this, you know, well, you know, the, the Lord's in my heart, and you can't see that. And I mean, that's, he said, Blessed are they that have not seen me and yet believe. But there'll come a day, brother, and all the unbelievers, when he comes back, it says, Every eye shall see him. Why? He is physically coming out of the heavens. And they are going to see him, and they're going to see, it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The Lord has a day of reckoning for this world. And he'll, he, he bears, uh, listen, what this, the impressions this world left on Jesus Christ, he's going to come back and leave some impressions on them. He's going to seize this world. He's going to seize the kingdoms. The Bible says the kingdom of this world become the kingdom of our Lord, His Christ. And I look forward to that day. It just doesn't stop with the death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, it tells me He's coming back again. I guess the real question is, has Jesus Christ made an impression on you? Has He? I know He's made an impression on me. 16 years of age, I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. The Bible says we are crucified. He says in Galatians 2.20. Let me turn over there. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. This is the last verse. I'm going to quit early on you today. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's interesting that when you get saved, all of a sudden you start bearing those same impressions that Jesus Christ bore. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Did he leave an impression on you? Do you feel impressed to be saved this morning? If you're unsaved and you're here, I sure hope, I sure hope so. I pray that you would Consider what He did for you. Come to an altar and let somebody show you how to be saved. It's that simple. That's how simple we made it. Let's all stand. If you'd come to the... Every head bowed and every eye closed and heard just playing the piano.